So now we're going to segue to our final discussion. Um, look up and smile for Big Brother. Uh, you know, we've been tiptoeing around and engaging um, at the periphery a lot of the trade-off issues involving privacy and individual rights uh, as we look at the expansion of these technologies, and that's the, an issue we're going to take head on in this, our last discussion, which is going to feature, among other folks, um, Daniel Rothenberg, who also deserves a special uh, shout out. Um, Daniel is a professor of law at Arizona State University and uh, so a great uh, partner to the Future Tense endeavor here um, and one of the kind of masterminds behind um, not just this discussion but all of today. Um, and the moderator here is going to be Matt Wald, uh, who knows more about anything flying, I think, than any other uh, living journalist. Uh, he's been at the New York Times uh, for quite some time covering energy, the environment, technology. Um, I was at the New York Times for a brief time, and, and I know that any times there was anything breaking that involved the FAA, aviation, um, I would run to Matt, and Matt would, would sit down and very patiently explain things to me, um, as he did with a lot of colleagues. He's a finalist for the 2011 Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting. <laughs> well, you never know. They could, they could come back, you know. If I was wrong. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for team coverage of the tsunami and nuclear disaster in Japan. Uh, so we're, we're really fortunate to have Matt with us, and he's going to introduce his colleagues. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, you now know what the in-flight meal will be on a drone. You just ate it. Uh, we, we have two panelists today. Uh, Catherine Crump, who's probably fresh from the witness stand of testifying somewhere on, on the, the incoming threat. She is a staff attorney at the ACLU. She focuses mostly on technology and privacy. And I intend to ask her about all forms of technology and privacy, including the, you know, the ubiquitous cell phone camera, et cetera, et cetera. She is a non-residential fellow at Stanford Center for Internet and Society. And Daniel Rothenberg, a professor of the practice at Arizona State University School of Politics and Global Studies, and a Lincoln Fellow for Ethics and International Human Rights at ASU. Uh, and um, this could be an interesting, I hope this will be an interesting discussion. I wanted to start out with, I think, the question that's on everybody's mind, which is, um, I've done a little skeet shooting in my time. Can I actually shoot these incoming drones in my backyard? And what'll happen to me if I do? <laughs> Can you shoot the incoming drone? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see what happens when, when, uh, when people start seeing these things buzzing over their backyards to, to, try to, to try to do that to see if we get an answer. I mean, it sounds like fun, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, it, I mean you can hold the neighbor's dog hostage if he comes on, on your lawn one time too often. What can you do with a drone? Um, I, uh, we had some discussion earlier, some mention earlier of the, the Jones case decided by the Supreme Court on drug, uh, following drug suspects. In that case, it was whether it was constitutional, <coughs> excuse me, to attach a GPS unit to somebody's car without a warrant. Uh, it strikes me that, that the court decided that case on the basis of physical intrusion. At attaching the GPS magnetic unit to the car was a form of physical intrusion. Drones are less physically intrusive. I want to ask about that in particular, and I want to ask each of you the broader question, which is why are drones fundamentally different from the cameras on the street, uh, which are either run by governments or available to governments, the cameras in my Blackberry, I'm one of the last six Americans to use Blackberries. Um, and the other forms of uh, social media uh, privacy intrusion. What makes drones different from those other types? But let me start with the specifics of the Jones decision. Are, are drones different? I think uh, the United States versus Jones decision is a good place to start because it shows that concerns about particularly long-term location tracking aren't just concerns that the ACLU has, um, but that even people like Justice Alito, who I suspect has never been an ACLU member, share. Um, in that case, the police, uh, the, 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 the law enforcement agents involved attached a GPS device to a car and tracked a car's movements for 28 days without having a valid warrant. Um, and the case made it up to the Supreme Court, and a fractured Supreme Court held that that was a search under the Fourth Amendment. Um, 
five justices and an opinion written by Justice Scalia held that because there was a physical attachment of the GPS device followed by a gathering of information, the device was attached to the car, that that was a search. But there were also five justices. Interestingly, Justice Sotomayor agreed both with Justice Scalia's opinion and one written by Justice Alito, who held that at the very least, long-term tracking of someone's movements violates a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and so I think that goes to your question. To the extent drones, like GPS devices, can, uh, can track people wherever they go for prolonged stretches of time, many of the same concerns arise. I would suggest that it's not, it's not necessarily that drones are, are so different. It's that we're focusing on drones because drones coalesce a whole series of fears and a series of real technological changes. So there, all too often we hear this discussion. I mean, if you've been on these panels, people will come to you and they'll say things as almost apparently silly as, are you for or against drones? <laughs> are drones good or bad? And there aren't too many technologies where somebody would come to you and say that, even technologies that that are problematic. We heard earlier today about even the Google car doesn't, doesn't seem to elicit that response. Right. So I don't think it's that the drones per se are always different, but there's something about what's going on with the discussion of drones that's focusing our fears and concerns so that it's a place for discussion, right? Whether, almost whether we like it or not. Well, let me pull you both back to the Jones decision. Uh, as Catherine laid out, some of the justices said it was unconstitutional because it was persistent, and some of them said it was unconstitutional because it was a physical intrusion. Uh, in that sense, the majority of the court seems to have said that uh, it was less of a challenge than other technologies. <coughs> Excuse me. Because, uh, the, of course, they were writing about a, a magnetic GPS sensor or, or broadcaster, but it was less of a challenge because it did not involve physical contact. Are we approaching this rationally? If, if we now have, suppose just for a moment that the police had not used a magnetic uh, tracer on the car, instead they used a drone. How would that have come out legally at the Supreme Court and how should we think about that? What might be analogous is there's thermal imaging that's already been used, and as you well know, there's a whole body of case law where you can drive by a, a home, and it's typically used to find marijuana growing and, and other, you know, where you see large amounts of power usage. Right. And, and I think we're, you know, we're embarking on a new era. This is really just the beginning of these kind of legal discussions, right? As, as these technologies become more pervasive, as they become more in fundamentally intrusive, it, it's, it's not really clear that tracking is about aerial surveillance at all, in fact, as we, as we well know. Right, but would the drone have passed muster with the Supreme Court if the police had used a drone instead of a GPS unit? I hope not. <laughs> if the but, drone it, but it would, wouldn't it? Because the swing vote was on the question of physical intrusion. I don't think it would have, actually. Okay. Four justices, led by Justice Alito, signed a plurality opinion that said because the long-term tracking intrudes upon a reasonable expectation of privacy that there was a Fourth Amendment search. Justice Sotomayor, the fifth vote for that position, agreed, agreed that at least long-term tracking and perhaps even short-term tracking infringes, uh, it, it is a Fourth Amendment search. Um, and logically speaking, it shouldn't matter whether you're being tracked by a drone, whether you're being tracked by a GPS device, physically attached to a car or through that BlackBerry you're holding right now. If the granularity of the data and the length of time on which it's being tracked uh, is, is you know, 28 days or 30 days, then, um, then, then it should be the same regardless of, of the technology. Um, and you know, the, the Supreme Court hasn't necessarily grappled with that question yet, um, but I don't think we can necessarily expect it to do so quickly. It took until the 1960s for the Supreme Court to rule for the first time that eavesdropping on a telephone call uh, implicates your, uh, is a search under the Fourth Amendment. And I think that's why you see this legislative push both in Congress and around the country to try to enact some rules, of, uh, try to enact some rules as Justice Alito uh, essentially asked uh, Congress to do in, in his decision in Jones. Let me ask the extent to which this is a problem that citizens face with their government, citizens, residents, illegal aliens face with the government, and to what extent it's a problem that citizens have with each other. Uh, let me be slightly anachronistic. Suppose we were replaying the Monica Lewinsky scandal today. I would imagine that she would be tracked by drones uh, and not by government drones, by private drones. 
to what extent is our concern about drones, our concern about our neighbor versus our concern about our government? And to what extent should it be? Well, clearly there are far more legal restrictions on the government's surveillance activities. Right. So in a certain sense, what you're opening up is this area that we, we can only imagine, right? Where suddenly all of us and our neighbors and various, various other players have access to, to any number of different surveillance data. It's, it's hard to even know where to begin if that popularizes you, the way you suggest. You can begin at YouTube, it's, it's there already. We've been fortunate, though, that there haven't been as, as, as profound, scandalous intrusions as you could imagine with long-term tracking and the like, right? Uh, I would imagine this would be a way for, for example, drug, illegal, drug retail, dr illegal drug distributors to keep track of their retail operations. I would imagine uh, this would be a way for, for legal commercial operations to keep tabs on each other. Uh, uh, Sur commercial surveillance, uh, surveillance by people who have feuds. Are we going to end up, I know both of you focus mostly on the Constitution which regulates the relationship of the government to people. Are we going to end up in a situation where the real issue is people to people? Or is this something we ought to be worried about? I think that is the hardest question in this entire uh, debate because um, there is a First Amendment. The ACLU prides itself on being a strong First Amendment uh, supporter. There are many drone enthusiasts here today and we have always believed that the First Amendment protects your right to take photographs, particularly in public places. Nonetheless, those of us concerned about privacy uh, are concerned about the possibility of people being subjected to persistent aerial surveillance, not just in places where that's traditionally been in the case, but also potentially in you know people's backyards or for longer periods of time. Um, and those of us concerned about government surveillance realize that any restrictions on government surveillance aren't going to be worth a hill of beans if the government can simply purchase the identical information from a private party. Um, and so what is the answer to all of this? Um, you know, that is an excellent question. There are some traditional laws in place that have always been there, anti-stalking, anti-paparazzi laws, um, which have upheld constitutional, which have survived constitutional muster, restrictions on peeping toms. And I think one thing we will see is that as these drones become integrated into the US airspace, uh, there will be lawsuits and the law will start to organically develop and we will see you know, how much more restrictive those laws become over time. Dan, is that, is that the right way to do it? I, I think what uh, Catherine is talking about is a sort of ma maturation and extension of common law. Is that the appropriate way to do this, or do we need legislation on this? Well, there will be legislation on this, right? Okay. Uh, I, I think as we see, so let's leave drones per se aside for a second in, in the idea that right now we're just talking about this thing that hovers over for extended periods of time and has this sort of singular advantage of being aerial. Yes. But that really isn't what's at the heart of what's troubling to Americans. Um, it's not even at, at the heart of what's been, tr about where this, where this debate originated in the, in the zone of war and how it migrated to the domestic sphere. So if we just think of drones as a stand-in for all of these complex, intrusive surveillance mechanisms. It's a Blackberry with wings. With a, black, a Blackberry with wings. And imagine that the data can be multiply analyzed we don't know where it's going. I think what's most important about this drone discussion is that it's very alive, strikingly more alive than multiple other, other elements of a surveillance state, like our, our phones, for example. We're, we're in a world where there's so much data being collected. I, there is no question that there will be some kinds of legislation. But as we know, legislation in and of itself is not as powerful often as its intentions would desire. And what, what is powerful is, is we don't have a social set of mores on this. Is that what we need? About what, you know, we have some sense of what is appropriate, for where I can park my car, where I can take my dog, not what I can do with my drone. Yes, I think that is one of the things that's needed. Um, but I think it's also, I think you make a really interesting point, and I think um, it shows how the debate around this technology is so different from the debates around previous technologies, right? Typically, a police department simply purchase a technology and months or years later, the public learns that it's being used, at which point you are told, you know, what's the problem? This technology has been in use for years. No one's been complaining, right? In this case, because there, was a pro there has been a prohibition on the use of drones domestically, 
domestically and we have this integration process, we are actually having a public debate, right? Forums like this, state legislation being proposed, um, and it's democracy at work. And, uh, and uh, you know, good, good to see rather than um, the fait accompli, which is normally how technology is adopted. What is the proper democratic forum for this? Was it, someone mentioned earlier, that Seattle, the police department bought drones and was barred from using them. I, as a private citizen, could presumably go to Seattle and use a, use a drone. Um, there are states that are legislating, counties, towns that are legislating. Do we need, is a national standard desirable? Is it achievable? Is it legal? There'll have to be a national standard for certain kinds of integrated drone use, right? As is part of the FAA plan. But you're getting to a deeper well, question, that's right? That's use, yeah. right. As yeah. I suppose we can leave the safety issue to the FAA. The FAA, to its credit, will throw up its hands and say, I don't know nothing about privacy, which is true. It's not their specialty. They're, they're good at keeping planes from crashing into each other. I mean, the interesting question is, are we better off with what's likely to happen, which is no singular centralized legislative system coupled with multiple cases that process their way through multiple different jurisdictions over a lengthy period of time that then defines what the law of the land is. Is that better or would it be better if from the top down there was a singular system? I think the first option is more likely, but it's an interesting question if we'd be better off with a more efficient centralized system. I want to pick up on one thing that you said earlier, though, which is that the FAA, to their credit, is, you know, in some sense, may wash their hands of this privacy issue. But I don't think that's to their credit. There are all sorts of government agencies which routinely take privacy into account. The Department of Homeland Security may primarily be a homeland security agency, but that doesn't excuse them from looking at how their rules and regulations impact Americans' privacy. So too should the FAA take privacy into account, because at the end of the day, they have no choice but to impact Americans' privacy. And a decision not to act is a decision that we will have a diminution of privacy. And so the idea that they can somehow be a neutral actor in this is simply not one that flies. Well, it <laughs> flies. <but laughs> oh, wow. Can I take that back? <laughs> it's Washington. You can revise and extend your remarks, um, which, which I will do right now. And, and it's related to the last question, which is there are a lot of things the FAA is very good at. And kind of like the waiter at lunchtime who says, I'm sorry, sir, that's not my table. There are a lot of things the FAA has no experience with. One suspects there must be a better forum for these decisions to be made, some agency that has better public representation and more expertise in dealing in this kind of question. I wonder what you think that agency might be. It's turning into a bunch of city councils, uh, some state legislatures, possibly at some point the Congress if they can ever agree on anything. I wouldn't put it at the, 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 the absolute top of the list of things I wish Congress would come to resolution on, but uh, uh, the, the FAA um, would issue a decision on this, would have so many acronyms in it, nobody outside the FAA would know what it meant. They're very good at what they do, but they don't do this stuff. Who ought to be doing this stuff? I mean, isn't the problem that, that, so the FAA will play a useful role, let's hope, in regulating this flying thing. Yes. But that really isn't, I think, the core issue. So it, would be, it wouldn't be reasonable to expect the FAA to get into the complicated question of surveillance and data in general. Your, your question of what would be the right government agencies, that's, a, that's a, not an easy question to answer. Um, I'm pretty sure, though, we're at the, the beginning of something quite transformative in terms of what all of this is going to mean socially. It can't be a phenomena that has a quick legislative fix. It's a broader issue than that. Are we... Well, it probably doesn't have a slow legislative fix either. Right. Are, are we over-focused on unmanned aerial systems uh, in the sense that the street you walk down to get here is covered with cameras? The internet provides the ability to track uh, all kinds of transactions, all kinds of personal activities. Uh, a lot of that tracking can be done by government. Again, some of it can be done by individuals. Are we focusing all our anxieties on drones inappropriately? Or maybe we're doing it appropriately? Well, you know, I think because drones haven't been uh, yet integrated into the US airspace in an extensive way, um, there's an opportunity here that isn't necessarily present with other technologies to get in on the ground level and try to 
regulate them um, that way. Um, but, but, you know, I, I agree with your fundamental point, which is that there are all sorts of technologies which enable uh, the collection of information about Americans and their tracking as never before. Um, and, you know, in some countries, they may take a global approach to privacy regulations. We've tended primarily to do things sector by sector. So we have a special law uh, for protecting video rental records and a special law for protecting, uh, you know, uh, other forms of location tracking. Um, and what, so is, what is a video rental? I'm not familiar with this term anymore. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, right. is, what is a video? <laughs> Oh, no, uh, yeah, right. Um, so we could continue taking an incremental approach, um, but it, you know, in some ways, what, what we should do um, in, a, in a perfect world is not the question. The question is, what are we likely to do? And we've traditionally regulated technologies on a, on a technology by technology basis, and so that's likely what's going to happen here. So if you were in charge, if you were both, if you had a supermajority in the Senate, if you could uh, posit a code of conduct, a, a code of rules, what would it say? What do you want? Oh, well, on the, on the drone issue, I should hasten to add that the ACLU is not opposed to the use of drones, right? This circles back to something you were saying earlier, which is that there are many uh, terrific and beneficial uses of drones which are absolutely appropriate, and we've heard about a number of them today. Uh, but I do think that they also pose unique privacy threats, particularly when long-term surveillance is, is at play. Um, and we think that uh, you know, the core of what we would like is when law enforcement is using drones, for them to use drones um, when they have a specific reason to believe that use of a drone is going to turn up evidence of a, of a specific instance of wrongdoing. Probable um, cause. And we don't uh, necessarily even advocate a standard as, as, as high as probable cause for certain uses of drones, um, although we wouldn't object to such a standard. Um, this is sort of the only time in my ACLU career where, where I've been outflanked to the, to the civil libertarian side by members of the, members of the Tea Party in particular, um, who've advocated a probable cause standard. Um, you know, and I think this raises another interesting issue, which is really talking about, about, you know, drone is such a broad term, right? And we can talk about something very tiny whose capacity is relatively limited or something that, uh, you know, can engage in a, a surveillance of a large geographical area in a persistent way. Um, and so the smaller drones are in some sense, at least right now, of less concern because they are like, just more likely by their nature to be used in a targeted way. Way, um, whereas the more persistent drones, I think, um, raise uh, you know, more, more grave civil liberties concerns from from our perspective. In other words, broad surveillance is more worrisome than targeted individual surveillance. Thank you for saying in 15 <laughs> words what I was trying to get at. I Dan, would, yeah, I, I suggest that we're actually lucky to have the drone debate because. It, and I also would suggest that drone is the right term to use, as some others have mentioned, because it carries with it. So it may be inaccurate in some degree, and, and those in the industry don't like that inaccuracy. But in fact, it carries with it a sense of foreboding and fear that I think is very real. And for a whole set of reasons that we understand and may not understand right away, the way in which drones have captivated the public and captivate us now is allowing for a discussion that previously just wasn't quite coming to the fore. And I think it has a lot to do with its migration from the military, military use and its terrifying use in military contexts, yeah. legal or illegal, depending on how you understand it, but it's terrifying power in a way that, that speaks of a future that's uncertain. And for this reason, it, it, it pulls at our fears and concerns. And I don't think that we should in any way um, we should, we should embrace and engage those fears. So drones are, we're lucky to have this drone debate. My personal view is a little different, which is Customs and Border Patrol, which flies big drones, has crashed half the ones it ever bought. Um, and the small ones, they have a military connection, but they really are Blackberries with wings. They're outgrowths of the, uh, of the cell phone. And I'm not quite so worried about what happens with the large ones and the government as the, the $500 drone that I could buy to, uh, for any, any personal or business use uh, and learn to operate pretty promptly. But enough of my anxieties. Let's try out the anxieties <laughs> in the room. Uh, I, I see a question in the, in the far back there. Yes, please, sir. 
Uh, hi there, my name is Rahul Man Sinha. My question is, uh, taking this back to the uh, concern about sort of citizen versus citizen uh, surveillance, uh, Ms. Crump mentioned uh, anti-stalking laws, but uh, what do you believe the threshold should be for the government's ability to buy or acquire privately recorded surveilled information, whether it's by drones or whatever other source? That's a good question. Well, I think if it's going to be effective, it probably needs to be analogous to whatever standard they have to meet to engage in that um, in that surveillance itself. Um, because other, if it's a different standard, then then you'll just incentivize one versus the other, which isn't the point. Dan, do you agree? I guess it just seems so. It really depends on what this commercial data is, and I mean, obviously, and how it's used. And it seems like a, an open world, right? Certain data is openly available and doesn't seem problematic. Other data would seem enormously problematic. Are and also wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily hold up in court, right, if that was the purpose of the data. Well, are, are we going to get to the point where instead of seeing a, a poster that says, you know, $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and capture of blah, 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 it'll be $10,000 reward for video leading to the arrest and capture of blah, blah, blah? Is that good or bad? I mean, some level of it is inevitable, isn't it? I, I think that's, I, in some ways, it's, it's useful that we tend towards the is it good or bad, but the real story is I don't think there's certain aspects of this progression that are unstoppable. Yes, yes. Um, over here, thank you. I've always wanted to design a beach ball you could stick a microphone in to be able to pass it around <laughs> a room like this. Um, I'm wondering. A drone would do. That's a good a point. I'm thinking too simple. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering what you, th what the panelists think about um, the potential for drones or whatever um, but drones, particularly technologies, to sort of push the envelope in terms of a reasonable expectation of privacy. Because um, right now, I don't think you can buy a commercially available drone with synthetic aperture radar, which is a type of technology that can see through certain kinds of diffuse materials like window shades, right, and get into Fourth Amendment protected spaces, um, and, and things like the Kylo kind of thermal imaging kind of things. Um, and I'm just wondering, is that, is, is that not a, a choke point for actually starting a discussion about that specific issue itself and being able to delineate certain kinds of, as a technologist, certain kinds of of, of, of physics that we shouldn't impose either in a reception sense or in an emission sense, emitting certain like lasers versus actually capturing optical light anyway. But these are, these are technologies I could buy today for personal use or business use, just not put on a drone. These technologies exist on manned aircraft and on some, uh, on a lot of um, more advanced um, uh, unmanned aerial uh, systems, but I don't think you, I don't know, someone in the room may know if you can actually, as a private citizen, buy these things. Maybe, I, I mean, you could probably easily contract them. They're not, you know, it's not like you need a special license to operate certain of those things. Well, your question made me think of something a little bit different. So, so one are all these evolving technologies. I and mean, I think thermal imaging already, as it's widely used in drug cases, and it's brought up a huge amount of concern. And we're only going to see more and more impressive and invasive technologies, for sure, right? But what I think is maybe more fascinating is the current way, one of the ways that drones are used now in the military arena is for patterns of life, as they call that, where, where, where complex data of the way people live is gathered, aggregated, analyzed, such that targeting decisions are made based on all of this. And if we think about that, that idea transferred to the domestic space, um, which in fact it already is in non-technological ways, right? There's lots of profiling. But imagine if the profiling was, was bolstered by 24-7 data, it would be a whole other understanding of what, crimin what criminal profiling would be. Uh, and, and, and you know, that's, that's just a, that's a direction to be, to think about, but it's also a direction to be concerned about. I think your question highlights um, 
one of the difficulties of talking about drones sort of in the abstract, because what a drone can do in terms of surveillance really depends on you know, the camera attached to it and what other technologies are in play. Um, it, and your question specifically was about how drones might impact the reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and, and that sort of depends on what that reasonable expectation of privacy test that the Supreme Court has established ends up meaning. Um, you were talking about thermal imaging. Right? In, in Kilo, the Supreme Court held you know, decades ago that when the police take a thermal image of a house and learn things about what is happening inside the house that they could not otherwise know, that is a search that requires a warrant. But it reached that conclusion on the uh, understanding that thermal imaging technology was not at that time in widespread use. Um, and I think there are real questions today, given the fact that many high-end cars have thermal imaging technologies now built into them, whether, uh, whether what the Supreme Court concluded in that case is true anymore. Does thermal imaging actually implicate a reasonable expectation of privacy? Um, so I think one of the, uh, the synthetic aperture radar that you were talking about is not in widespread use. Uh, and so uh, if that were used, you could certainly see how something like that would implicate a reasonable expectation of privacy and therefore Fourth Amendment concerns, whereas simply attaching you know, your standard digital uh, point and click camera to a drone wouldn't necessarily raise the same types of concerns. The, Go, the ubiquitous GoPro 3 soon to be replaced by the GoPro 4, and God knows what that one will do. Right, right. Over here, thank you. Oh, um, oh I'm sorry, go ahead. Assuming the widespread consumer use of drones, oh, I'm sorry, my name is Gautam Hans, I work at CDT. Um, do you think, or could, or should the Supreme Court uh, reconsider or limit the third party doctrine? Ex explain what the third, the third party, party doctrine. doctrine holds that um, if a private citizen gives information to law enforcement, uh, that information be, may be used, what? May be used by law enforcement in uh, trial without the judi prior judicial review. So the question was about the third party doctrine. Um, and so the third party doctrine holds that if, if you reveal something to any third party, then you have no Fourth Amendment reasonable expectation of privacy in it. Um, and if that is the case, then the game is over and we are done and none of us have any privacy interests anymore because today, uh, you know, your email is held by Gmail, third parties have all sorts of information on, on people. Um, I am optimistic that that doctrine will not, in fact, swallow the entire Fourth Amendment rule. I simply don't think it can be the case. I think that doctrine is articulated in a very different time um, and that, for example, the Supreme Court would never conclude that you have no Fourth Amendment privacy right in your email simply because Gmail has it rather than this, you know, your mail being transmitted by the Postal Service. I um, mean, I think drones could play, could play a role similarly there. Um, William Angel, again. Given, given the increased proliferation of drones and the decreasing cost of advanced sensors, should we be more worried about a little brother scenario or little brothers plural? You know, your neighbors with their drones with, you know, maybe a thousand dollar drug detector attached wandering around, you know, smelling all that marijuana you're growing and then either, bl and then blackmailing you over that. Should we more be should we be more concerned mm. should we be more concerned over being blackmailed by neighbors and private citizens than we should of Big Brother collecting all of our information to use against us? And if you were concerned, how would you address the concern? <laughs> <laughs> we're all looking at each other. You know, it's it's. It's, I think we're all sort of looking at each other because I think it's quite possible that what you suggest will, will be a serious concern, right? That technology across the board is going to get so cheap and so powerful that it's going to be used in all sorts of ways, um, you know, that we haven't necessarily even anticipated yet. Um, but I have to say, sitting here today, playing all of that out and figuring out what to do about it uh, is, 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 is more than, than, than I can do, but fortunately not, not more than we need to do, and we can take things one step at a time. I, say, I mean, sure is the quick answer, but we could analogize this, this new set of technologies with other once revolutionary technologies that allowed for the, record, the private recording of information, say cameras, which at one period of time were, were radical. 
um, recording devices of simple handheld varieties. Have they been used for blackmail? Of course. Uh, would legislation have prevented private citizens from doing that? Probably not. Uh, no doubt there will be some forms of, of, of blackmail, of harmful use of whatever emerging technologies are coming down the pike. Uh, we have time for one more. Could I quick, quick Go ahead. Should we be more worried about th that, about you know, little brother, than we should about big brother, in your opinions? You're, you're reiterating my question because, <laughs> right. It's, right, because it's not the $1,000 sensor, it's really the $250 setup. It's, or it, we could have a changing social moray where, you know, 20 years from now, my grandchild asked me, what, you don't have aerial shots of my mother's wedding? You know, well, didn't you have drones back then? I mean, we, 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 have an, a, we have an established set of principles that help guide us in limiting state behavior, or at least we hope they help guide us in limiting state behavior. I think when it comes to limiting what private citizens do, we can't just turn to legislatures and the like. This is an interesting question. What's going to happen to our, so our society? Like you say, mores, are we going to develop ways to be respectful of each other and deploy all of these invasive technologies at the same time? Or, or change our definition of what's respectful. Sure. But I think, I think you're right in pushing the idea that the, the private use could end up being the more privacy invasive because, you know, as you were starting to say, the government is something that you can regulate. You can find it and you can regulate it. Even third-party intermediaries like the big internet service providers, right, There's a, or telecommunications companies that now have so much data about all of us, even there, there are a finite number of them and they can be regulated. But when you start talking about cheap and easily available technologies being in the hands of every American, um, it definitely poses a more difficult thing to, to, uh, to potentially limit. And I, sh I should say that this is all a rather hypothetical discussion and I think most uses of unmanned aerial systems are going to be pretty boring. Sure, of course. Flying between the rows of corn, uh, looking for signs of uh, where the corrosion is on the, on the bridge or the, uh, whether the power line is down, etc. Uh, and some of this discussion five years from now is going to look prescient and some of it's going to look off base. <laughs> And we'll, we'll come back in five years and discuss it then. Thank you all for your kind attention.